to a tranquil village where life is ruled by the changing of the seasons, comes a young woman who has her own ideas about life. Who is that woman? That's the new mistress. She has no knowledge of farming. But I will astonish you all. Three men are captured by her beauty and spirit. It wouldn't do, Mr. Oak. I'm too independent. I need somebody to tame me. I have great respect for you, but I cannot marry. But you started something in me. One is a soldier who awakens her passion. What do you know of Emma? Do you think he's honorable? Because I think he has little or no conscience. Leading to a tragedy that will engulf them all. But to God, you could tell me your secret. Mobile Masterpiece Theater presents Thomas Hardy's tale of a woman with a lot to learn. And of the man who never gives up on her. I'm gonna love you always. Far from the madding crowd. Beginning tonight. It was deep winter when I first looked at the program you're about to see, and I had one of those colds that make you feel so sorry for yourself you want to break down and cry. Four hours later, that's how long the show runs, I was cured. Oh, I still had the cold, but I no longer wanted to die. I'd been to a wonderful place. One of those places they don't make anymore. Never will again, I suppose. And I'd met a fascinating bunch of people. Not all of them suffused with goodness and light, to be sure, but people I'd cared about, even those who were not as good as they should have been. The program is far from the madding crowd. You won't be watching all four hours of it tonight. We're showing it in two installments, each two hours long. It's one of Thomas Hardy's early novels, and it's a young man's book. He was 34 when he wrote it. In his later work, like Tess of the D'Urbervilles and Jude the Obscure, Hardy's world became terribly bleak. The world he paints in Far From the Madding Crowd, however, is full of light and joy in the beauty of lives governed by the Earth's natural life cycles. It's the story of a beautiful woman, Bathsheba Everdeen, and the effect her beauty has on three different men. Bathsheba is a very young woman, very impulsive and very proud, sometimes to the point of arrogance. She can also be foolishly mischievous, and this weakness is going to make her life unpleasantly complicated. First installment, Far From the Madding Crowd. 47, 47, look at me, 47, 47, 48, look at me, 48, 48, 49, look at me, 49, 49, 49, 49, look at me, 50, 50, 50, 50, look at me, 51, 51, 51, 51, 50, sold a farm roll for 50 shillings. Mistress's niece, she better shift her backside off that wagon and find her other chubbins. Oh, mistress's niece ain't gonna pass. Tell him I won't pay him another farthing. Two fever. Here. Let her pass.
Schütze allein.
game if you like. Independent. 
I need somebody to tame me. You'd never be able to do that. Who says I couldn't? Don't give me your answer right away. Let me call on you. No. I don't love you, so it would be ridiculous. Then I'll ask you no more.
huh? Sold everything. I thought you were insured. Gave all I had for the sheep. What have you left? Nine shillings and sixpence.
Shepard, man. Uh, do you want a shepherd? I, I do want a shepherd. But... He's the very man, mistress. If the wheat rick had gone, the barn would have followed for sure. Is this shepherd done most good? Uh, he's all there, ma'am. So he is. Aye. <laughs> Tell him to speak to the bailiff. Will you all come up to the house for something to eat and drink? Yeah, we could take it a great deal freer, ma'am, if you send it across to Warren's Mald House. Oh, yeah. Of course. Good night to you all. Hi, mistress. Hi, mistress. Thank you. Oh, 
of the young man in Casterbridge. Do you know his name, Marianne? No, miss.
Yes, sir. Adam? George? Come on. Come on. Awful.
I don't know the difference between good goings on and bad.
with all my heart.
Hardy was in love when he wrote Far From the Madding Crowd. He'd been in love with Emma Gifford for three years or so, and married her soon after the book was published. Emma's father was a lawyer of sorts, the alcoholic sort, some said, and he thought Hardy was socially beneath him, referring to him as a low-born churl who presumed to marry into my family. Hardy's people worked with their hands. They were masons and bricklayers. For a long time, Hardy, encouraged by his mother, wanted to go off to Oxford or Cambridge and maybe become a clergyman. Unfortunately for English literature, that was not to be. Oxford and Cambridge in those days were not for the bricklaying classes. Instead, Hardy was apprenticed to study architecture. He was quite good at it. Good enough to earn a living when he left the rustic life of Dorset and went up to London. There he began writing. No one's ever explained the chemistry that makes gifted writers of people apparently destined for humdrum lives. But Hardy had the gift, and not just for fiction. He also produced first-rate poetry. Far From the Madding Crowd was his first popular success. It was set in the quiet beauty of Dorset, a county in the southwest of England on the Channel. Hardy used Dorset as a setting for many of his stories. In later books, its beauty becomes an ironic counterpoint to the dark events he creates on its landscapes. But darkness hasn't yet infected the man who's writing far from the madding crowd. He's still young and in love, and everything is going his way. For Mobile Masterpiece Theater, I'm Russell Baker. Good night. Next time... Oh, you must be heartless. ...on Mobile Masterpiece Theater. Does a woman keep her promise, Gabriel? She's young yet. An impulsive flirtation may have ominous consequences. You care for your reputation. Be more discreet towards this soldier. Don't let him come into my sight. What difference does it make? Oh, sweetheart, she is. Since she can't be yours. The conclusion of Far From the Madding Crowd. Far From the Madding Crowd is available on home video cassette for $29.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call one 800 Two five five. This is PBS. To order the companion edition of Far From the Madding Crowd, call 1-800-255-9424. This hardcover book is $16 plus shipping and handling. No. Send him away. I shan't be seeing Mr. Mallory ever again. He's much too simple a country boy. I'm going to London where I shall marry a gentleman. And I'll live in a big, fancy house. And in the summer, we shall travel to France. And spend our days eating chocolate. I'll street in Byron and Baudelaire.
say, oh, Carmen, how nice it is to see you, basically, you know? And first of all, there was no hola, hola, Jose, and apparently the, everybody was looking and somebody said, oh, Carmen, how nice it is to see you. And then I came in later and I said, hola, je suis ici, like I'm here, you know? And everybody sort of looked, Placido looked like, where the heck were you, you know? It was uh, a real privilege to be invited to sing at the Royal Opera House. This place alone has such a history. One of the things that struck me funny uh, in the rehearsal process when we take breaks, everybody would always say, should we go have a cup of tea? And I remember <laughs> thinking how strange that was. I never thought, uh, you know, when I have a break, uh, I'd really like a, a cup of tea right now. Uh, I remember that as something that really uh, struck a chord inside of me as being sort of funny and cute. In the, in the La Mour, Zuni, Habat, Zuni, Habanera, who's the guy that picks oh, me up? Oh, the actors. He'd be a soldier. Do you guys know who that is? Do you know who the guy is that picked me up? I think I'm one of those people who enjoy the three-ring circus, you know? I'm often energized by a lot of those last minute things that go on and I feel a certain surge of creativity. You really sort of have to have eyes all around your head and be aware of how you have to put yourself in a way outside of your body and be aware and this is a certain, this is a different type of talent to be aware of what you look like on stage. That's how you want it? That cough in the dressing room proved an ominous warning after all. By the end of Act Two, Denise Graves felt she was losing her voice. When I found that I had to cancel the debut or postpone the debut, that was a real heartbreaking uh, situation because the Royal Opera House of Covent Garden is, is one that is held in such regard and such high esteem amongst people in the profession. We've got two, three days and just relax and everything is fine. Just forget it. It's fine. It's life. It's normal. And you are wonderful. Believe me. You're wonderful. And always wonderful. I was finally there. And I had to cancel in a role which I had had uh, uh, a bit of success with, so I was comfortable. And I really wanted to go there and do my thing and make my mark. And, and then I got not just ill, but really, really sick. Can you fix me? Just tell me that now. I'll do my best. Give okay. me a chance to have a look and see what's going on. I'm going to look in your nose first, okay? I mean, I, I really didn't know what was going to happen. And it was the first time that the doctor mentioned cortisone, which is, a, I think, a four-letter word in the industry. A lot of, lots of singers have, have had to take it before, you know, if you're in a situation where you've got to perform. It was not something that I pondered a lot, uh, feeling sad about. I thought, better not to do it than to do it, and, and uh, there was no way I was going to do it under those circumstances, or that I could. The voice sometimes does its own thing, but then when it finally came, I was so hungry to be up there, I thought, I'm going to get up there tonight, and I'm going to show these British people wh what Carmen is all about. She's the best Carmen around, you know, there's no doubt. She's so really full of passion and she's so believable on the stage you know so beautiful so it's everything is very believable you can lose your head for her yes absolutely have you of course you know every night <laughs> i kill her for that every night <laughs> Performing is important to me, and my work is important to me. And so it doesn't matter if I'm performing in front of a bunch of school children or at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. For me, it's the same, and I, and I try to do the best that I can do on that day, at that time, under those circumstances.
She wasn't doing brain surgery here, right? You think she took her job too seriously? Would you rather be treated by someone who didn't? I think Nurse Master Simone never took time to smell the flowers, which in the hospital is not a hard thing to do. <laughs> well, you have a sense of humor. I like that in a clinician. So it says here that you had a mastectomy five years ago. I was uh, told to get reconstruction, but my husband, he died three years ago. I'm sorry. Yes, well, my Nathan, beloved Nathan, said, why bother? One breast is plenty for both of us. So I settled for a specialized procedure. No coffee. 
I'll settle for your telephone number. A disembodied voice in the dark. You can hang up whenever you want. What harm can that do? You are a very determined woman, Mrs. Rosner. I'm alive. That's right. You most certainly are. So, what do you say? Seven little digits that could change your life. I've got a checkbook here. I can write a check for 75 bucks right here on the spot if you give me your telephone number. Going. Going once.
the dog. So, uh, what are you wearing? What do you mean, what am I wearing? I just walked in. No, it was a joke. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, like what guys say when they call really late at night. And, what yeah, it was lame. Oh, the bit about the five dollars, yeah, that was supposed to be a joke, too. That's supposed to be funny? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't funny, was it? Listen, um, why don't I call you back and see if we can get this thing off onto the right foot? Should I do that? You don't have to do that. It's just, you see, I, I'm just not very good at, at this sort of thing. I, I, haven't, I haven't done this in a really long time. Well, you know, thought it would be a good idea. Yes, you could say your mother's very convincing. <laughs> yes, she's definitely overwhelming. Well, what do you say? Should we humor her? I'm willing to uh, give this thing a shot. You are. Mm -hmm. I'll arrange everything. In fact, you know what? I'll even pay for everything. I know what that means. No, I won't expect anything in return. Who have you been talking to? Uh, okay, then. We will get together on the one condition that <laughs> this is a self-sacrificing act of human compassion with absolutely no ulterior motive. And I will pay my own way. Tuesday? Tuesday at 7 o'clock. That would be great. Um, okay, so where do you live? I live at 613 Fountain Avenue, apartment 5D as in date. All right. Five days in date. I can't believe I just said that.
someplace else. Home. Someplace quiet. Now. Why don't you just say something? Aren't you going to ask me in? What? Oh, I'd like to come in and visit for a few minutes. Why? Because I have some phone calls to return. Uh. No, because I find you attractive and I don't want the evening to end. Don't worry about my feelings. Doesn't that count for anything? Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. How do you feel? You want the truth? Yeah. I'd like to go to bed. Alone. This isn't a problem for me. But you have to admit, we did have a good time. Uh. Don't thank me. Thank my mom.
came to drive me home. I'll just go to the ladies' room. Actually, I have to get back. I have patience. 45 seconds. I timed it. <laughs> I've been meaning to call you. Sure you have. I have. It's a very nice jacket. It's very, very intimidating. Thanks. So how's my mom? Well, we'll know a lot better next week, but you shouldn't worry about anything until you have to. If you have to. Can you do that? No. No, I'll worry anyway. See, I love her a whole lot. I can understand that. I just want to say that from across the patio, you make a wonderful couple. So there. Have you met my mother, Helen? He likes her, but he won't call her, and I can't make him budge. Helen Rosner, I'm disappointed in you. You remember when Thomas was a little bitty thing and he refused to eat his pea soup? Well, you just took the bowl and put it over in front of Gordy. Thomas snatched that bowl, and that soup was gone faster than snow in July. I'm just my, telling my, you that you don't... My nutritionist wants to know what I can eat here. He can't eat that much roast beef. What are you weighing on now, Gordy? I'm 204. 345. 345. I love your crystal. Oh, no, that's glassware. This is crystal. Sometimes I am so dumb. No, no, it's only us superficial girls know the difference. Thomas. Uh, more potato? Hmm? I uh, called Dr. Eddingham's office this afternoon. I talked to Jane. I asked her what she thought of you. You didn't. She said uh, she thought that you were a very nice person, but that you're not her type. She said she's been going with someone, and she thinks that it's getting serious. So I guess you better forget about it. I... Really? Mm-hmm. Excuse me, Mom. Hey, Mom, where's the butter? Mm -hmm. Is it really such a mystery? Where do you think the butter is? In the refrigerator? That's right. So did your legs break? Whoa. Go, 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 go. <laughs> All right, Saturday night? Okay, good. I'll pick you up at your place. I dress formal because it's going to be a top of the line, state of the art date, all right? Okay, bye. Is butter in the tub the same as real butter? That was Jane Cronin. I'm going to see her this weekend. Really? Thought you weren't interested. Change my mind. Tom, I'm so sorry. I tried to reach you at the office. I have a hundred and three fever. Anything else? Some aspirin or some ice cream or something? What is it? Are you in pain? I'm a nurse, Tom. No one ever looks after me. something. Makes me feel like I'm 78 again. Look at you two. You guys are madly in love. You kids are nutty about each other. You have a, a, a wonderful relationship, a, a wonderful long, long-term relationship. Why would you want that to end? Tell him, Ivan. I want to play the field. I'd, uh, I'd, uh, you're a, you're a mature extremely mature woman. Let me be frank with you. See, I date a lot. I heard. It's very cold, very cruel, and competitive out there. Do me a big favor. Stay with Saul. Give it another, well, another decade. Then we'll all get back together and we'll talk and see how things are then, okay? Miss Cronin is here. Excuse me a second. 
Send her in, please. Updates here. Come on, Saul. Let's give it another ten years. And a boy, Sully. He dates a lot. <laughs> I know. Hi. Hi. You look beautiful. Oh. Here, come here. Thanks. Got a surprise for you. Wow. This is romantic. Well, you're dealing with a very romantic guy here. Oh, I forgot. I didn't know you liked jazz. Neither did I until I met you. Shall we dance? <laughs> you like caviar? Yeah. Do you like sushi? No. Good, neither do I. How about dogs? To eat? No, as pets. Yeah, I like dogs. How about kids? As pets? Yeah. <laughs> no. As a commitment between two people. I love kids. Something 
to eat. Well, I gotta get going. I have a client. Gordy. Black. Hey. Hey. Hey, you Thomas Rosner. Where do you think you're going? You come back here. Don't you think you should go back to your mother? She needs you. I don't want her to see how sad this makes me, Katie. You bring your white ass back here, you'll have the devil to pay, and the devil is me. Katie, I can't.
is really hard. Are, are you okay? Have you been drinking? Oh, a threesome. I don't think so. Jane, this is not what you think. Actually, you know, it's, it's worse than you think. Jane, listen. No, I don't have to listen to this. I'm really sorry about your mother, but I don't have to put up this kind of behavior. Jane, I'm sorry. That's not good enough. I don't need a pamper, an immature son of a bitch! Was that your wife? Too bad. She seemed nice. Listen, if it's okay with you, I'm not into this anymore. Take me out to the bar and the jewelry that Marshall's given you over the years. Oh, Marshall has such divine taste in jewelry. Marshall, you'll take possession of the piano and the vacation home in Aspen. It's going to be so empty there without you and the kids. I... Oh, I know. I know. <sighs> Billy and Andrew will remain in custody of Sarah, but, Marshall, you'll have them on the weekends and one month during the summer. One month? I can't believe we're breaking up the family like oh, this, I know. I, I feel so... so selfish. <sighs> so, so self-involved. The remainder of the art and the furnishings in the apartment. Oh, well, I don't want the king-size bed. <laughs> Whenever I looked at it, I'd be like...